as an academic institute and think tank at the Faculty of Law, Thomas Hart University in 2009, we are dealing with human rights issues as a focal point of our work with a variety of different activities from research and teaching to advocacy, consultancy and professional training, mainly in the region of Southeast Asia. Something which came again and again along the way of our activities was the impression of a concurrence of quite different approaches, attitudes and understandings of the globally growing relevance of human rights regimes emerging largely independent from each other. 
Still, it seems to us from the perspective of an institution being active mainly in Southeast Asia, that human rights causes are perceived in many societies in the non-Western world, not only ambiguously, but in a multiplicity of ways, a phenomenon we try to describe with the phrases hegemony, impotence, empowerment. I guess we have gathered a quite interesting range of professional perspectives and topics to reflect on these modes of encounter with human rights. In organizing this conference, we unluckily faced an unprecedented number of already confirmed speakers declining on short notice, even with good reasons each, and that is why I have to thank now uh, uh, to the very kind readiness of Professor uh, Mohamed Zani and uh, Mr. Zhu Zengji, uh, who were able to replace them finally, and I'm very, very grateful for that. So we have replaced two speakers who could not come. I have to thank very much our Faculty of Law for kindest support in organizing this conference and also our staff, which worked very hard at the end of the year to make that possible. Very much I have to thank our guests convening today, in particular our speakers who came all the long way to Bangkok in a special time at the end of the year and in spite in spite of a political crisis lingering on, which caused some countries to discourage their citizens from traveling to Thailand, what I think is not necessary at all, but the more I'm very happy that you are here and I cordially welcome you once more. Concerning your personal safety, I assure you that you will remain absolutely untouched by any troubles. You can feel safely and you can enjoy this wonderful country. Due to our convention at this time of the fading away of the year 2013, I hope that this special time will contribute to the atmosphere of our gathering today and tomorrow, might we all enjoy it not only as an academic opportunity presenting interesting facets and perspectives of our topic, but also as an opportunity for nice personal contacts and enriching discussions in a comparatively small circus of, circle of people united in the same interest, at an interesting place and on a memorable occasion. We very much hope you all will benefit from the two days ahead in many ways and engage largely in the upcoming discussions. Thank you very much. Kokumaka. Thank you very much, Mr. Hindenglasser, for such a warmest welcome. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we move to another prominent session, the presentation program. And now I would like to invite Professor Ragna Kapoor, Kapoor and Dr. Hitoshi Nasu to the stage for the presentation. And Dr. Rawit Kanitase will be taking the role of discussant. Please enjoy the session. Thank you.
only teachers at the Jinda Global Law School, but also at an institution which is in Geneva. I must admit that it is the first time that I hear about the Geneva School of Diplomacy and International Relations. Uh, and I, I'm very glad that we have somebody of a caliber to be with us today. Professor Kapoor has a BA from the University of Delhi in History, a BA and an MA from Cambridge, and an LLM from Howard Law School. She has had many, many activities, and still has have them too. She's very active, particularly in the field of feminist legal research. She has been a visiting professor at the Graduate Institute for International and Development Studies, visiting professor of law at the Coca-Cola World Fund Faculty Fellow Yale Law School, that's in Newhaven. Global Visiting Professor at the NAU Law School, Visiting Professor at Georgetown Law School Center, Visiting Faculty United Nations Peace University in Costa Rica, Visiting Faculty Department of Law at the Zurich University in Switzerland, Visiting Faculty National Law School of India University in Bangalore, Visiting Fellow at the Howard University, at the Howard Law School. Visiting Fellow at Cambridge University. Visiting Faculty Drake Law School. Visiting Faculty University of Miami Law School. And Visiting Faculty Erickson Castron Institute of International Law in Helsinki, Finland. The next speaker, Dr. Nasu will talk about a different subject, namely on the freedom of information and national security in Asia. Dr. Nasu is a senior lecturer in law at the Australian National University at the ANU teaching international law, international security law. Uh, that is very interesting for me because at the time I was a lecturer, we did not have that subject yet. International humanitarian law, military operations law, and migration law. He holds a BA and MA in political science from Aoyama Kim University and a Master of International Law and PhD from the University of Sydney. He's the author of many, many books. One on peacekeeping, and then on human rights. And then I think I, I noticed that he, he he has a tendency to specialize in, in the Asian Pacific region. And I think the topic that uh, Dr. Nasu will be, uh, be sharing with us you know, deals with the security, with the national security in our uh, region here. But he is also interested in arms conflict. And that is very, very interesting. And I think all these subjects, if you Look at them, you know, they, they do have a common element.
direction. I ask myself. And I think that is one. And you know what? That is secrecy. Because if a person is being raped, that's a secret that is usually being kept. And within the, in the case of the freedom of information, there are certain things that we have to keep by ourselves. And that is secret. I think with these few words, you know, I would like to give the floor to you, Professor. You may use the podium, you have 30 minutes, but usually the concentration is around 20 minutes or so. <laughs> I'll so, try so, my so, best. So. Okay, fine. I wonder if I can have a light on here, please. Uh, thank you so much, it's such a great pleasure. Can you hear me? Am I working? Yes? It's such a great honor and pleasure to be invited here today uh, and to... Um, to thank both the Faculty of Law as well as uh, CPG for inviting me and for um, hosting such an extraordinary interesting event and so unusual in my view to talk about human rights from the perspective of hegemony, um, impotence and empowerment. Uh, in other words, already assuming we have a very complicated approach to human rights in this part of the world, what I call a sort of post-colonial third world emerging economy kind of uh, understanding or approach. If I speak too fast, if I speak too fast, raise your hand <coughs> over there in the back. Um, so I'm going to talk about a topic that many are really quite familiar with, but use it to try and unpack these assumptions about hegemony, impotence, uh, and empower empowerment that informed human rights law. In December 2012, almost to the day, actually, a young 23-year-old woman and her male companion uh, were returning uh, from watching a film at night, uh, The Life of Pi, in a well-known multiplex cinema in New Delhi. They alighted a private bus uh, after trying to heal some, some rickshaws and and Delhi has a really quite a poor uh, trans and erratic transport system. So they lighted this private bus that slowed down with tinted window windows, and of course the nightmare, their nightmare, on the Delhi streets began. Two hours later, they were stripped, dumped, naked, and bleeding on the road near Delhi's new listening airport, International <laughs> Airport. The young woman had been brutally gang raped and had suffered traumatic injuries as a result of an iron rod being inserted into her. She subsequently died of these injuries, and the young man uh, she was with had been beaten badly and suffered uh, serious uh, uh, traumas and, and uh, fractures. Now, this event triggered massive protests in India, which was in many cases already an extraordinary situation. Where in the world um, have you last seen young men and young women come out onto the streets to protest the issue of violence against women uh, and make, bring it to the center of the political agenda. That is extraordinary. I don't see that happening in the Western uh, Europe or North America at all, right? It just doesn't trigger that kind of interest. Economics will, but not this kind of issue. And of course, as a result of this outpouring of anger by young men, young men and women, both men and women, uh, a committee was constituted by the government, uh, and that committee brought forward some very bold and uh, important recommendations to try and confront sexual violence through the discourse of rights, specifically foregrounding the right to bodily integrity and sexual autonomy, and to legalize adult consensual sexual relationships. That's quite a bold move, uh, especially in a country like India, which does have some conservative uh, values. And so this response by the committee, consisting of retired judges, Supreme Court judges, um, actually challenged the outmoded notion of Indian womanhood, which is based on chastity, conservative sexual morality, honor, purity, heterosexuality, which has usually framed any discussions on laws dealing with sexual rights in post-colonial India. 
There was also a recommendation for marital rape, as well as an opposition to the demand for the death penalty, which some quarters uh, requested when it came to cases of, uh, uh, of sexual violence. But what's important is that while this committee was very bold and I think very forward-looking, uh, certainly was connecting with the young people in India, the Parliament of India actually enacted a law that left out almost every single one of the key recommendations that would advance the rights of gender equality and respect for women. It imposed the death penalty in cases where rape leads to the death of a victim or permanent maiming. It retained the provisions dealing with outraging the modesty of a woman, which is an antiquated Victorian piece of let, uh, 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 provision in law. It intens intensified the security apparatus of the state, ostensibly to secure and ensure the safety of women, and it retained the exemption of marital rape from the purview of the criminal law. So it was really sort of cher cherry picking when it came to the report uh, and the new law. The new law really set up a legal ed edifice that's focused primarily on security, sexual surveillance, and law and order, and left in camp dominant gender and sexual arrangements, which were based on these dis discrete categorizations of men and women, uh, masculinity and femininity, as well as a very conservative understanding of female sexuality as passive, as vulnerable, encased in this stultifying. Uh, uh, understanding of Indian cultural values. At the same time, it seemed to, in the process, augment the muscular power of the state to regulate and discipline the sexual behavior of its citizens in the direction of fewer rights and more surveillance. Uh, the compelling question then, after three decades of human rights advocacy on the issue of gender, how did this appalling episode of violence against women come to be articulated within the stable categories of gender and invite state intervention in the form of criminal justice, stringent sentencing, and a strengthened sexual security regime? Right? So how did it go from what looked like an empowering agenda to one that was pretty retrograde, but nevertheless did empower someone, not necessarily the individual's concern, seemed more, more, it, it seemed to have empowered much more the state and the law rather than the women. The three parts to this talk then, in response, in trying to unpack this question. I look at the carceral and sexual security regime uh, that was produced by the Delhi Rape uh, as informed by the way in which both gender as well as the gendered other third world female subject, have been predominantly addressed in international law. And uh, in the second part, I look specifically at the work that gender does uh, in the area of international human rights and how it facilitated the rise of this sexual security regime. The three areas I'll focus on very briefly, because of time, oh, wow, is, um, is trafficking, anti-trafficking interventions, wartime rape and the Rome Statute, and the Security Council resolutions on gender, peace, and security. And then I try and return to the Delhi rape and look at how it works with gender, or the work that gender does, how the work that gender does in international law converges with this neoliberal political and economic rationality that contains, disciplines, manages the potential for gender subversion or gender disruption. The convergence of both the state and non-state interests uh, in the form of a st uh, stricter sexual security apparatus uh, and an emphasis on carceral strategies or security strategies really, again, leaves us in the end with this question, can gender ever be a force for empowerment in circumstances where the state and market interests are partly based mm -hmm. on securing the stability of gender and sexual norms through security, carceral vision, or carceral approach, rather than to facilitate women's human rights. All right? So let me just take a quick look at gender and international law. Um, the 
it's really based, as I said, on the stability of gender, on reestablishing it as something that's normative and natural as well, um, rather than something that's a social construction that can be upended or altered or manipulated. Uh, the dichotomization of gender based on gender and sex has informed a lot of the human rights work on women's rights in the area, in, 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 in the UN, in the United Nations. And women's human rights advocacy is partly responsible for retaining this dichotomy between gender and sex. The idea of gender and sex, that is sex is something that's natural and gender is something that's a social construction, was actually put into crisis by the work of the feminist legal theorist, uh, Judith Butler. And she actually looks at how gender is something that you constantly have to repeat as a performance. And then certain meanings get attached to gender. It's the apparatus through which sex is produced and rendered then as both pre-discursive and normal and natural. In other words, how does sex and gender come to be established as normal and natural arrangements? She talks about discourse actually brings this about. Um, I have done a lot of work here on, in the paper on how uh, even queer theorists have in fact tried to challenge this understanding of sexuality as something that's normal and established and in fact how it in fact is destabilized and becomes part of uh, an apparatus for governing individuals. And look at the work of Joseph Massad, who's uh, an Arab theorist. Uh, who tries to challenge the way in which identity categories such as gender or homosexuality and heterosexuality are set up. Um, but what's important is that what I want to really touch upon is really some of the third world critiques, the critiques uh, that have been introduced by the third world approaches to international law as well as post-colonial feminism, which looks at how the other sexual, gendered, other was constructed in law. And while male and female bodies and ideas have been overwhelmingly understood in international law as naturally different, these bodies have invariably been displaced onto a first world and third world divide, which often operates against the idea of civilizational differences and cultural superiority of the West over the rest. And this difference is constructed against definitions and assumptions about colonial masculinity, colonial femininity, culture, and who constitutes the universal. Knowledge about the other was often produced based on civilizational differences, but the, the other was civilizationally inferior, and part of this was demonstrated through the treatment of the other by the other of its women. Okay? And this idea of the other, as civilization in Africa, continues to be produced and operates in how, it, it continues to inform the way in which human rights operates as a, a sort of a savior of victims from savages. And what Gayatri Spivak has said, uh, interventions by white men to rescue brown women from brown men, okay, based on this civilizational divide. So this trend, tradition and antiquity, which are cast as primitive and serving libidinal desires, operate to make moral judgments about the native and uh, the treatment of women. And the focus on culture becomes a main reason for depriving rights, uh, for the deprivation of rights. Not only does it reinforce the idea of women as victims, but also the idea of culture as a negative force and a feature that's attributed to the third world. Gender becomes the vehicle for reintroducing these notions of primitiveness and backwardness, while also making invisible the ways in which rights are undermined, let's say, through neoliberal economic processes. Right? So it obscures that by focusing on culture, by focusing of the civilizational divide. So post-colonial feminists have exposed the idea of gender, uh, of the gender other, as being viewed as almost more victimized and vulnerable and, and, and uh, in need of protection than her first world counterpart. 
And these overgeneralized claims about women in the third world are hegemonic in that they represent the problems of privileged women who are often, though not exclusively, white, Christian, middle class, heterosexual, uh, as, as, as the problems of all women, universalizes those problems. And it, it projects women in other cultural contexts as perpetually marginalized and underprivileged. Uh, and this, of course, will have serious implications on the kind of strategies then that, then that will be adopted to address these kinds of harms, particularly, as I say, uh, the strategies that focus on rescuing uh, brown women from their more savage uh, and, and barbaric environments in the form of stringent punishment, incarceration, or strengthening techniques of sexual surveillance. So here I'm now going to move into looking at how these critical insights on sovereignty and gender move, a, move away from looking at gender as a noun to looking at, instead, the work that gender does. If we keep on treating gender as a noun, I think we might be forced to conclude that a human rights is impotent. But if, if we start looking at gender as a, uh, a, a, as a sort of uh, an adjective, uh, and look at it as the work, in terms of the work it's actually doing in international law and human rights, I think that might lead to a more interesting way of engaging with gender and make it help us understand why we end up with a more partial vision when it comes to gender. So let me look at these three topics to to my second part, which is, the first is the sexual tra sex trafficking and international human rights. Uh, since uh, 1993, and even before that, uh, women's human rights advocacy has been put on the, the map, so to speak, and women's human rights have been recognized as part of the international human rights uh, regime. Um, but since that time, since 1993, we have seen many states get on board with adopting a women's human rights advocacy, but invariably that translates into the strengthening of a law and order agenda and the focus on criminal justice provisions. And I think this is most evident in anti-trafficking interventions, uh, where the gender continues to be aligned with victimization, vulnerability, and uh, sexual oppression. Uh, in the UN protocol that was adopted uh, in the 90s as well. Um, the focus was intended to move beyond, say, uh, vulnerable women in the third world, especially those who were channeled or trafficked into prostitution. But in the public discourse around the protocol, we see it retains its focus on prostitution and violence against women in the broader public arena, and in fact has served as a mechanism for states around the world to enact legislations in response to anti-trafficking that invariably lapse into uh, the use of sexual and moral surveillance techniques over women, which betray a visceral concern over uh, primarily border security, right? So strengthening border security and, uh, and, and controls at the border become a, a prominent um, a form of, of response to, and to, 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 the, to the efforts to stop trafficking. I think this concern reflects an increasing obsession with national security, law and order, and border protection in the context of globalization and market ideology. Women who cross borders are constituted invariably as moving involuntarily and invariably as victims who need to be rehabilitated, rescued, rehabilitated and protected from a clandestine criminal regime of smugglers and traffickers. Uh, in fact, the strengthening of border controls itself has partly produced the rise in a clandestine migrant mobility regime. Because if safe legal measures are not available for women and others to move, then they will invariably resort to uh, uh, traffickers or smugglers uh, as a way of moving. But the, what's important is that the discourse continues to be informed by this idea of the woman, of the female other out there, as someone who's vic invariably victimized and vulnerable and in need of rescue. I think this uh, in anti-trafficking interventions not only <coughs> are tend to be used to uh, 
um, uh, to show off um, the gender credentials of nation states. Um, but in fact, what they, what they do is illustrate, what, at least what I tried to do in this discussion, is illustrate how an entire regulatory regime can be established without necessarily addressing the problem that triggered the concern in the first place, the exploitation and violence against women who are moved or move across borders by clandestine networks of traffickers and, and smugglers. Instead, the interventions, which depend on a law and order approach or criminal justice approach, continue to objectify these women through the lens of victimization and appeal to the state for redress. And in fact, these interventions seem to be then missing the point altogether. As in the case of the Delhi rape, such interventions don't empower the women who are supposed to be the primary objects of concern, but rather strengthen the state regulatory apparatus and the sexual surveillance of women's lives. The second issue is the, move, is the issue of gender and uh, the International Criminal Court. I might not be able to get to the third issue because of time, but let me just touch upon the gender and uh, wartime rape and the Rome Statute. We saw in the process of the Rome Statute, uh, feminist interventions quite single-mindedly trying to focus on prohibiting rape in war and prosecute it vigorously. Uh, it, gradually, the feminist focus actually expanded to cover not only rape in war in, and in relation to belligerent forces, but to view these things as being part of the bigger global war on women. Um, and both uh, uh, Janet Haley have, uh, as well has done a w wonderful job of, 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 uh, of going through exactly what processes were used to try and advocate this sort of uh, rape in the context of this bigger global war against women and the downside of that. In other words, to speak of what David Kennedy has called the human rights advocacy as being part of the problem. The argument was that the acceptability of rape in peacetime causes rape in conflict and is based on this capacious conception of male domination, where rape is imagined as part of a bigger male war against women. So feminists basically wanted to have, to have unlimited jurisdiction over sexual harms. Again, the specific focus on criminal law and carcerality to pursue a social justice agenda was the central feature of this advocacy. Uh, and it really reflects part of a broader set of technologies of power, quite specifically how gender, in the context of international criminal law, continues to operate as something that's a stable ca category, yet the function that it performs is to regulate and manage uh, behavior and conduct, as well as dis discipline behavior and conduct, rather than to empower. The goal was to move sexual violence up the ladder of criminal law and demand more stringent sentences and to make sex crimes a specific set of indictable offenses. Uh, again, this kind of thinking similarly informed the interventions on part of some of the human rights groups, but especially also the women's rights groups uh, in the Delhi rape case, which really highlights how international norms and laws produced uh, as abstract and universally uh, and, and universal, concomitantly construct and rework also domestic norms. Now I'm going to uh, move away from, I'm not going to touch upon the uh, gender peace and security resolutions, but basically just reinforce the idea of women as more peaceful, as naturally more peaceful, and having more women at the table um, uh, is, is, constitutes a gender perspective, right? And there's nothing more to it than that. Uh, I'm doing a rather crude job here, but again, in the interest of time, uh, I can't really go into it. But it's certainly not an empowerment, uh, a, 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 an empowerment project, an empowering project. So let me just summarize briefly, uh, quickly. Women's groups and human rights groups have continued to imagine the international and national legal orders um, are heavily consolidated in this top-down understanding of sovereign power. So they focus a considerable amount of attention on criminal justice, law and order, tightening the, sexual, the security apparatus of the state, which in turn justify restrictions on women's rights, regulate and discipline sexual contact, context, conduct. Sorry. 
for the protection of women, which of course does not produce positive results. By continuing to appeal to the state as the central custodian of women's rights, feminist and human rights advocates, I think it failed to address the way in which power is dispersed and also that power operates to constitute subjects, to constitute categories, and indeed, it's a very powerful weapon uh, when it comes to law. Law itself constitutes women uh, as vulnerable, as uh, victimized, as those in need of help, rather than having any kind of recognizing their subjectivity. Feminism in the process here becomes a technocratic, technocratic enterprise. It's not revolutionary. It's not empowering. It's no longer about interrogating and challenging current practices and structures. It now no longer offers the possibility of gender going rogue, right? But it's a means of, in fact, facilitating, legitimizing an existing uh, project of international law in the guise of addressing women's rights concerns. Okay, so let me sort of come to the sort of concluding remarks here. Well, you know, whether we can think in terms of human rights as empowerment. I think we can't really do that. We have to look at human rights as discourse, a discourse which all sorts of actors participate in because it gives them some sort of legitimacy, right? It's a discourse where competing visions of the world are fought out, including competing understandings of women. So the Vatican now can be project itself as pro-women's rights. It does a terrific job in in, uh, say, Beijing, right? Um, it's sort of pro-women working, pro-equality, uh, pro-family, um, uh, you know, and it uses human rights to advance that kind of, or articulate that kind of agenda. Um, and other, you know, groups, certainly the Hindu rights in, in, in India, are doing exactly the same thing and trying to project human rights as, um, as integral to uh, equal treatment of women, and the people who don't treat women equally are the Muslims. So in the process, what it's trying to do is advance a highly communalized agenda in and through the discourse of human rights. Um, so let's look at coming back to empowerment, uh, and I want to look at the issue in the context of the neoliberal term. Uh, let's look at the rape protests in Delhi, and the responses that they provoke when it came to understanding ideas of empowerment uh, and what are the sites of this so-called understanding of empowerment. The good thing or important thing or interesting thing about the protest is that they sort of did exemplify shift away from traditionalism in which gender has been encased. You know, men and women were saying, uh, holding placards and saying, uh, I'm not your mother, I'm not your sister, I'm not your wife, you know, I'm an equal citizen of this country. So that's a really interesting challenge that definitely came about. At the same time, I think they also represented a shift in the direction of a neoliberal political rationality that is increasingly characterizing and shaping the terms of gender within the global context of international uh, law. Remember the young woman who was raped and killed, she represented the aspirations of millions of young women in the 21st century in India, and I think in many emerging economies around the world. She came from a lower income bracket. Her parents sold their land to support her desire to become an educated professional, and she, in turn, wanted to support the education of her younger siblings through her earnings. The image of this aspiring young Indian woman in a neoliberal setting really challenges the normative understandings of Indian womanhood that has been embedded in a more familial discourse and informed ideas of femininity, not only in post-colonial India, I think a large part of the uh, third world or uh, post-colonial world. Let's just say the protesters mark the arrival, I think, of a particular form of sovereign autonomy. A neoliberal, a neoliberal political rationality rationality provides the contemporary framing of sovereignty within the context of gender and sexuality for these groups. It's an articulation that expressed in the direction of greater sexual autonomy and sexual expression that is both personal as well as political. 
But it's also an expression of subjectivity that's constituted within the context of neoliberal economic and social management, by which I mean it produces subjectivity where individual freedom is understood in terms of the freedom of the market and trade. Right? That's how choice is even articulated. It becomes a hegemonic, it becomes hegemonic as a mode of discourse and internalizes a common sense way in which to understand and interpret the world. In this respect, I think it produces a subjectivity that's not necessarily resistive or counter-hegemonic. Right? It's the market that, that de defines freedom and choice and empowerment. So while this uh, new generation is invested in competing and consuming without the interference of a bloated state, it somewhat contradictorily continues to appeal to the state to ensure stability and security to facilitate this freedom. And that could be in the form of, I don't know, police and bus stands, not necessarily in terms of right to equality, right? Um, at the same time, this freedom is embedded in this idea of self-sufficiency of the individual and successful competition in the marketplace. So these neoliberal conceptions of gender, in my view, are unlikely to bring about a rupture or disruption of existing normative understandings of genders in a way that actually moves us in the direction of more freedom and empowerment. Uh, the discussion, I think, raises the question about the possibility of empowerment. When the idea of state sovereignty is unpacked and the processes of international law are exposed as already pursuing normative understandings of gender, does this not then limit the possibility of realizing freedom and empowerment? If so, then what is the actual impact of these processes? Do they just reinstitute the normative arrangements as opposed to destabilizing them or disrupting them? Perhaps what's most important here is not to try and pursue an elusive and illusory idea that rep rights represent the power that the individual has taken away from a sovereign state, but to address the way, what I tried to do, in which gender is pursued and the work that it does, which is not necessarily progressive not necessarily empowering. It is not necessarily a force for radical change, in other words, but it's the work it does in the hands of those who wield this power which needs to be addressed and should be the project or focus of those who are interested in pursuing a more transformative vision. Thank you very much.
uh, the legal uh, infrastructure and development uh, in this region. And um, uh, state secret, uh, state secrecy, the whole state, state secrets rule, um, is um, is an aspect high with this idea of a regime security or state security, as I'm going to explain in this presentation. Uh, so that's going to be the focus uh, of my talk. So um, um, it's um, it's an exception to the freedom of information, uh, but in in some countries, uh, state secrets law has its own regime. And uh, uh, we can't really uh, explain or understand the development or the significance or operation of the state secrets law uh, without really understanding what we actually uh, uh, understand as uh, national security uh, in each different uh, country or region. So that's going to be the focus of my talk. So just a little bit of background. Um, uh, the state secret law is a topical area at the moment uh, in across Asia and perhaps across the world. So uh, you or perhaps it may not be necessary to give you uh, uh, in-depth uh, background information, but just as we have in, uh, a couple of them, uh, uh, recent developments uh, in the world, and particularly in Asia. Uh, on uh, uh, 6th of December uh, this month, uh, 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 this year, uh, the Japanese Diet uh, uh, introduced and adopted uh, the Special uh, Secrecy Protection Act uh, after uh, following them, uh, after uh, um, quite a short but intense uh, a media debate or public debate about uh, the appropriateness of this uh, uh, new act uh, but after the controversy it was still uh, uh, enacted uh, by the majority of the ruling party. Uh, but it's not really an exceptional move if you look at uh, surrounding countries. In Asia, uh, the People's Republic of China uh, revised its uh, law on guarding state secrets in 2010. Uh, Indonesia also introduced and enacted uh, the new State Intelligence Act uh, in 2011. Uh, and the many uh, Eastern European countries uh, enacted the State Secret Law uh, in early 2000, uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, in order to implement the NATO's uh, uh, secrecy uh, policy uh, in order to become a member of, um, of the EU. So it's not really an exceptional move, it's a sort of, um, it could be seen as a part of a worldwide move towards the codification of the state secret law around the world. And the concerns have been also expressed around the world. Uh, so um, uh, many uh, human rights activists and uh, organizations uh, are gathered together uh, to adopt uh, a sort of best practice principles uh, in terms of uh, how the state secret law should operate uh, in relation to freedom of information. And uh, that cut back, uh, cut, uh, cut back uh, that, 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 that amounted that became principles, um, uh, and from the same famous ones include uh, uh, Johannesburg, uh, Johannesburg principles adopted in 1997, and most recently, uh, Taban uh, principles adopted in 2013. Uh, and uh, in those uh, principles, uh, uh, concerns are really expressed, and um, uh, human rights advocacy uh, groups uh, came up with uh, good uh, best practice uh, examples as to how national security, the concept of national security, uh, should be uh, um, uh, confined uh, to a certain uh, narrow uh, uh, focus. The question uh, in the presentation I pose is how then do the Asian countries apply the concept of national security as an exception uh, to uh, freedom of information? Uh, often it's considered as a national security exemption uh, to the uh, freedom of information. How, does, how do they actually conceive or understand the notion of national security? If you, if you look at the uh, level of legislation across the region, uh, there are basically uh, three different types uh, uh, by which the state uh, enact the state secret law. Uh, in some countries, uh, uh, the state secret law is a part of the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, so the countries like um, uh, India, Indonesia, Pakistan, and uh, Korea, Thailand, Cambodia, all of them. Uh, have the Freedom of Information Act, and they have typically have one or two provisions uh, focusing on uh, um, the protection of national security information or the state secrets legislation or the clothes. Uh, whereas the other states like um, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Myanmar, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, China, Indonesia, Japan, they enacted or enacted uh, a dedicated, uh, specific uh, legislation uh, uh, for the purpose of the state secrets, uh, protection of the state secrets. Um, in other um, very minor, uh, minority group, 
countries, so, uh, like the Philippines and Vietnam, uh, they use the ordinance for the executive order. So there's no legislation in place yet, uh, but those executive order or ordinance has been used to protect the state secrets. So those are the basically three different ways that Asian countries enact or operate uh, state secret protection. And uh, if you look at the international human rights discourse, um, uh, state national security is recognized. Uh, it's, uh, it's a recognized um, uh, category of exemption uh, in terms of freedom of access uh, to information. Uh, so uh, if you look at Article 19, Paragraph 3 of the RCCPR, it's clearly stated uh, with um, uh, some limitations to that exception. Uh, likewise, uh, in this region, as in the human rights declaration uh, uh, adapted in 2011, um, it uh, also uh, stipulates the freedom of information that is subject to the general uh, uh, limitation clause. Uh, if you look at that, uh, those clauses uh, carefully, um, you can identify uh, two uh, legal restrictions uh, to the use of national uh, security as a ground for uh, exception to the freedom of information. Uh, first, an easy one, a procedural requirement, is that the exemption must be provided by law and all the Asian countries comply with it. So it's not really a significant issue. The more serious issue is the second requirement. The exemption must be necessary. Um, the treaty term uh, doesn't really explain what it means by being necessary. Uh, but the uh, as Human Rights Committee uh, elaborated on this point in the uh, uh, genome comment number 34, uh, stating that uh, it won't, it, it just provide an example, it is not compatible uh, with paragraph 3, for, his, for instance, to invoke such laws to suppress, withhold from public information of legitimate public interest that does not harm national security or to prosecute journalists, researchers and other people uh, for having disseminated such information. And in that comment you can actually discern uh, two important components about Human Rights Committee's idea about what is considered as necessary for the purpose of national security. One is about the scope of national security. Uh, there has to be a, uh, some defined notion of national security even though that really explain it, uh, but certainly it, uh, it in indicates that there should be some defined scope of national security uh, by saying that uh, there will be um, um, uh, some national security that can be harmed by releasing or disclosing information. The second element is uh, uh, the extent of the protection. Uh, so it's one thing to say, well, it's a national security information therefore uh, must be protected. Uh, the sec uh, it's another thing to say how that security information, national security information, should be protected. Uh, so uh, this comment also indicates that the, the, uh, the extent to which the pro uh, national security can be protected should also be limited. Um, and uh, 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 it also says it must be proportionate uh, to the interest to be protected. Um, Inter-American uh, declaration, uh, Inter declaration on the principles of free freedom of expression uh, goes even uh, uh, further, uh, saying that uh, uh, um, it, um, uh, it, uh, uh, well, it has to be exceptional only in the case of a real or imminent danger that threatens national security. So it's, it's expect just not just a, a proportional uh, response, but even higher threshold to be crossed uh, for the purpose of protection of the national security information. So let's start with the scope of national security exemption. Um, if you uh, uh, in the survey of uh, various um, uh, legislation in the region, uh, I've identified three basic different approaches uh, to the uh, identification of national security uh, definition in the legislation. Some countries adopt a source-based approach. Uh, basically, uh, uh, they identify uh, relevant sources, um, uh, relevant departments as the uh, source of information. So if any information generated by a particular uh, ministry, for example, military defense, uh, would be categorized or would be classified as secret information. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the, uh, what the intention is. Uh, irrespective of the intention, uh, uh, as, uh, as soon as it's released or generated from that department, that's classified as secret information. Second approach is a class-based exemption. Uh, so in those countries, so basically, they uh, set out certain categories of, of uh, secret information in the legislation and typically include the national security as, um, as, a, as a category of um, uh, classified information. Uh, Prejudice-based exemption is similar to the class-based exemption. The only difference is that uh, in the legislative term, 
it's not just about any information about national security, but uh, information about national security which would actually harm or jeopardize uh, the state's interest. Uh, so that's the only difference. But you, there are uh, various countries that adopt uh, one, one or combination of those uh, three different approaches. And um, um, interestingly, uh, also if you look at this term, uh, national security is often listed uh, separately uh, to national defense. Um, under the traditional uh, sort of international relations or even international law, uh, uh, the traditional understanding of security is about uh, national security from external uh, threats or attacks. So it's about defending the state from aggression from another state. So national security traditionally is about national defense. But if you look at the Asian uh, countries' legislation, national security is considered as something different from national defense. Uh, so it's not the national defense, it's something else uh, they consider as a national security. And um, 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 uh, that, that, uh, that's uh, quite clear, uh, for example, in the Malaysian uh, Offshore Secrets Act, it lists documents concerning the security, defense, and international relations as, uh, uh, as the, um, the documents that need to be classified. Uh, uh, um, the China, uh, in the law on guarding uh, state secrets, also uh, lists uh, uh, safeguarding state security as se a separate uh, a document as a, a secret in the building of national defense. Um, and um, um, so, but if you look at the uh, sort of common law countries, uh, state secret law, particularly in the UK, US, and Australia and Canada, um, it's clearly envisaged uh, traditionally uh, as a, a defense against the espionage or a treason, uh, treason uh, uh, against uh, 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 in external interference uh, and, uh, uh, and, lo uh, and the loss of, um, of, of their capability, capabilities uh, against the enemies. So it's a quite a different conception of national security you can uh, sort of um, uh, identify in Asian countries and uh, relevant legislation. And um, uh, in the Philippine Supreme Court uh, case of uh, Almonte and uh, uh, Kids, uh, uh, the court actually uh, clearly stipulated and, and, and explained uh, the rationale uh, for uh, the state's uh, national security exemption uh, in, the, in the Philippines context. And that's, quite, uh, that's, uh, that's equally applied. Uh, to uh, uh, many Asian countries, and their rush policy rationale uh, for state secret uh, uh, or national security exemption of um, uh, information. The Supreme Court of the Philippines uh, explained the rationale of state uh, secret as being based on the public interest of such paramount importance as uh, uh, in and of itself uh, transcending the individual interest of a private citizen. So they, they can see that national security or state uh, security is a sort of a public order uh, issue, and uh, that's, um, uh, that's a quite a significant uh, amount of societal public interest that needs to be protected, uh, even at the expense of a certain individual's rights. Uh, that's how they conceive uh, the uh, significance and policy rationale behind the state secret uh, uh, legislation, particularly this national security exemption. Uh, and uh, China, uh, when they revised uh, their state secret law in 2010, uh, it certainly reflects their ongoing policy to expand and tighten information control uh, in the digital age. So they're not really concerned about espionage, well, they, uh, to some extent concerned, but their uh, immediate concern is not about espionage by foreign uh, uh, agents or foreign um, um, uh, intelligence service but rather internal uh, security threats about the citizens using a, a, a cyber uh, information network uh, in order to uh, undermine state legitimacy, for example. That's the most central concern uh, to many Asian states. If you look at the extent of national security exemption, uh, good, the best practice examples uh, are set out uh, by many uh, by those uh, principles uh, stipulated or provided or came up uh, uh, with. Uh, by uh, uh, eminent uh, human rights advocate, uh, advocacy groups and uh, uh, scholars, uh, include those principles. Uh, uh, and um, those principles, this relevant principle, can be summarized into three different three points. So, the uh, general principle about national security exemption uh, in terms of that extended protection 
is that national security exemption should be limited and proportionate to the legitimate interest to be protected. So proportionality is a general principle. And it says that something like that disclosure must actually harm or is likely to harm a legitimate, a legitimate secu national security interest. Uh, and the risk of harm from disclosure must be greater than the overall public interest in disclosure. And, uh, uh, and even the restriction uh, must be the least restrictive means available to protect against the harm. So it's, uh, it's setting up quite a restrictive, very strict um, uh, um, uh, restrictions uh, to national security exemptions uh, in this best practice example. But what, is, what about the actual um, um, practice, safe practice in Asia? Certainly no regional state uh, adopts this uh, approach that uh, national security exemptions must be protected to a real and identifiable risk of significant, significant harm. Uh, no, uh, no such provision can be seen, can be found in any of the legislation in Asian countries. Um, in the source-based countries, uh, and in those countries which adopt the source-based exemption approach, uh, no disclosure at all uh, is, uh, is, uh, is permitted. Uh, so once it's uh, produced by a certain uh, uh, department, then it's classified and uh, no ground for, uh, no public interest ground, for example, uh, for disclosure. Um, um, in, in the countries where the class-based exemption is adopted, uh, they actually incorporate uh, the harm, uh, uh, harm test uh, uh, in terms of the disclosure of the information, permissible disclosure of information, but only in the context of criminal offence. And I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'll be turning to that uh, in a minute. And the third uh, 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 group of states uh, where the prejudice-based exemption is adopted, it's already incorporated into the definition of national security. But the problem is that uh, uh, they only say that the war, if, it's, uh, if it will uh, jeopardize the state interest or national security, then it cannot be released. But the question is who is going to decide uh, whether disclosure will actually jeopardize the national security interest. Um, uh, that question uh, um, is not really answered, it's not really qualified. Uh, in any part of the legislation in any other country, in any countries. Um, but there is a, a significant tension, a fundamental tension here as to uh, how and who should assess uh, national security argument. Uh, and uh, there is a classic uh, debate uh, about it in the UK and in Australia, so I'm, I'm happy to talk about this perhaps in a Q&A later. But in the Asian context, for example, uh, uh, in the uh, Malaysian uh, Supreme Court case, Seacock uh, Hall, uh, at C. M. M. Uh, against uh, Chong Kui Sen, I think it's, I can't pronounce it correctly. Um, basically, the uh, majority took this traditional view that uh, if the originator or the owner of the document uh, treats the document and the information contained in it as an official secret and clearly marks it and keeps it as such, then it is not open to anyone, even for the judiciary, to regard it as otherwise. Uh, so it, if the uh, a person who uh, generated the information decided this is a secret, then uh, that's secret. Uh, no one can con uh, contest uh, 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 the appropriateness of that decision. Only in a, uh, uh, only the dissenting judges uh, express different views. For example, uh, uh, Judge uh, Yunus of the uh, Malaysian Court of Appeal in a different case uh, expressed the view that uh, it must be proven uh, that disclosure of a certain secret information uh, has to be detrimental. Uh, is detrimental uh, to national security or public interest uh, to be actually uh, classified as a, a secret document. So there are some different approaches, but majority view is that the law it can be contested uh, before the court. Um, sorry, uh, one more thing. And public interest override uh, in any of the uh, in any of those um, uh, in none of those uh, uh, Asian countries. Uh, public interest override is not generally available. Uh, only exception is Thailand and India uh, allows public interest override. So if there is any uh, public interest in, disclo in disclosing the information, then the public officials are allowed to disclose the information, but it's limited only to Thailand and, um, uh, and India. Um, and many Western countries actually now adopt the uh, practice of certification uh, so if there is any genuine national security concern, the minister, the relevant minister, can actually certify uh, a document as a top secret, as an unclassified, uh, as, a, as a classified document that cannot be unclassified. 
it's not really an unusual thing happening in Asia. Moving to the disclosure of it, so, uh, this is uh, just a summary of um, uh, what sort of that, uh, um, um, uh, regime has been established in many uh, Asian countries. Uh, so uh, countries like Malaysia uh, and Singapore uh, basically criminalise uh, any uh, disclosure. Uh, um, so it's not just about disclosure, but even a failure to take a reasonable care of the state secrets or even mere receipt of uh, information, someone outside the public uh, or someone outside the government, if they receive the information, then they can be also criminally charged unless they can prove that they didn't have a desire to obtain the information. Uh, Indonesia also uh, maintains a similar sort of uh, strict regime. Um, and um, uh, uh, Philippines, China and Vietnam adopt uh, the harm test as part of this uh, offense, uh, criminal offense regime. So basically in those countries, a uh, person may not be charged uh, if they can prove that uh, the disclosure of the information actually didn't uh, jeopardize the national interest, for example, or didn't cause any harm um, 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 to the national interest. Um, so um, uh, there are some uh, uh, differences in terms of approach uh, to uh, the actual uh, uh, disclosure of it. But uh, um, commonly, uh, uh, what is commonly found in those countries is that harm test is always somewhere, uh, either as part of the disclosure of offence or as part of the definition of national security or the extent of protection of national security information. Uh, so um, uh, that's a commonality uh, across, this, uh, across this region. But what you can actually find uh, as a central sort of fundamental uh, dilemma, uh, it's not really unique to Asia, if it's common to any uh, state, but it's, uh, it's more saliently uh, uh, emphasized uh, um, in Asian uh, countries, is this difficulties of balancing uh, national security and the human rights discourse in Asia. Um, this, the reason why it is so difficult, I think there are many reasons, but I can identify perhaps three uh, different reasons for these difficulties. One is about the subjectivity, I already explained the national security. Uh, who is going to judge what is national security? Who is going to assess? Uh, and how they are going to assess national security? There's always an element of subjectivity. Um, and um, uh, there's a, 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 a very traditional uh, sort of debate about uh, whether the national security uh, should be uh, objectively assessed or it is something uh, always inherently uh, subjectively uh, assessed. The second uh, uh, reason for this difficulty is um, uh, increasingly the information uh, cannot be uh, um, uh, separated, uh, it cannot be divided. Um, uh, one piece of information, uh, there are a lot of different aspects to it. Uh, in the old, good old days, uh, one piece of information, it's either national secret or non-national se national security secret. It was uh, pretty much uh, uh, crystal clear. But nowadays, uh, even though the information <coughs> itself may not be national security uh, um, uh, sensitive information. The methodologies they used, for example, methodologies they employed in order to uh, 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 discover this information may be classified. And because of that reason, because of that methodology, which is national security sensitive, the information is classified as a national security, a national security secret. So um, um, uh, one piece of information, for example, could actually disclose uh, illegal activities of the government or the human rights violations uh, committed by the government. But the same piece of information, particularly the methodologies they employ, has a legitimate national security interest. So you can't really simply say that this particular piece of information is not really national security, genuine national security information. Um, it's always a combination, both elements may actually coexist in relation to one uh, same piece of information. The third reason for the difficulty is uh, um, the idea of public interest in Asia.